Here we go. Plastic pollution is in everybody's problem. Plastic is in our lives to the point we're dependent on plastic. It's, it's also in the top five of nature's biggest crises. And unfortunately, it's starting to kill us. Literally, it is killing us. 23 million tonnes of plastic ends up in our oceans, our lakes, and our rivers every single year. This is 83 garbage trucks of rubbish every hour of every day of every year, and it's getting worse. Plastic is in our bodies. Plastic is in our hearts. It's clogging our arteries. The chemicals in plastic isn't just the problem. It's the small size of the particles that are causing inflammation in, our, in, in human tissue. Plastic is now being compared to asbestos, which is scary, really scary. Climate is hot topic at the moment, right? Plastic's making a comeback. And I don't know if you saw that there, but climate, hot topic, trying to throw in a dad joke to lighten up the room, because this is a heavy, heavy topic. So in 2016, what we did, it was the most obvious thing in the world which we made, uh, we, we threw a trash can in the water to filter microplastics and plastic pollution. Uh, rubbish bins on land, um, you know, sea bins in the water. And for us, we thought it was great. We thought we were going to fix the world because we're cleaning this shit up. But then we realised that cleanup isn't a solution. You need prevention and you need to do both at the same time. So why am I here? You know, we're here for net positive and net zero when I'm a plastics guy. You know, plastics is my jam. So to make it relevant to, to you know, why I'm here on stage is all I did was take plastic and I put it in front of net zero and net positive. So plastic net zero is to pull out the same amount of plastics from the environment that has been produced or used uh, to, to not have an increase. Plastic net positive is to remove more plastics from the environment than is produced or used to you end up with a reduction, right? So we just, we just copied what was going on with net zero and net positive, and it's pretty cool. So we've got the solutions, right? But what's holding us back? Why isn't the world fixed? Well, it all comes down to money. And more importantly, it comes down to profit which is a trigger point for a lot of people because profit is all, uh, it's mostly linked to uh, big companies benefiting while other people suffer. But the problem is you need money, you need impact, you need profit to create this, to attract investment, to, you know, if, if more nature projects had profit, the world would be in a much better position than what we are today. Profit does not have to be evil. You need money to pay for things. You need to pay for equipment. You need to pay for salaries. You, you, know, you can enhance employee well-being with more profit. You know, what we found is that nature projects generally operate as charities or you know, research projects and this type of thing. And They're doing well. They get donations from amazing people to do amazing work, but they're not attracting the investment that they need to scale up the operations that they need either. So to go forwards, we're going to go back a couple of steps. I've worked for a lot of dickheads in my life. <laughs> and I wanted to be like Patagonia and have a cool company with flexibility and supportive stuff. And and I just found that book, Let My People Go Surfing, so I read the book and I copied it to the best that I can. And I have my moments, sometimes I'm a dickhead, sometimes I'm not, but I hope that other people have moments as well. I'm not the only dickhead in the room. But for us, you know, to move forwards, I needed purpose in my life as well. I craved it, I had a good job, I was making a lot of money, there was no purpose. And so I wanted to use my skills to help others and, and help the environment. 
And so CBIN was my light bulb, but there was one crucial piece of the puzzle that was missing, which was data. So data, I found out, was needed to make, you know, you, you need evidence of what you're doing. You can make better informed solutions to problems that you have, and people will understand it, and you can back yourself with it. For us, you know, we were filtering the water for microplastics and plastic pollution. We knew how many litres we were filtering, we knew how many plastics that we were counting, and we, we really quickly realised that we are filling a, a data gap, and in this day and age, that is rare, because data is king. To scale things up, you know, we, we're using our data to, to attract companies that want to do good for the environment. They, they want proof of impact to show that you know, for their marketing, ESG, um, reporting purposes to show that they're doing good for the environment. But the other reason, the other purpose that we have for data is to, is to support legislation. So the 2022 bag ban by James Griffin, who was the Minister of Environment at the time, um, that went into play. We're seeing our, our data shows a 71% reduction on this bag ban, which is amazing. You know, so I reckon we should just give James a little clap while we're here. Thank you, James. Right? Bands do work, but we need the data to back this up as well. In 2016, the tech was groundbreaking, right? In 2020, we pioneered this model that we're going to filter uh, plastic pollution, we're going to clean up cities, entire cities. And so we thought that was great. But, you know, we got the, we got the tech, yes. Do we have the data? Yes. Are we doing good? Hell yes. Do we have enough money? No. No, we don't. We need to work on that. And so for us, we needed to build a new model. And for us, it was, you know, we needed profit because we need to attract investment because we think we're doing good, we know we're doing good, but we need to do more. Carbon market shows that it is profitable to monetize nature. We saw some of the mistakes it was making. We thought, OK, let's learn from this and we'll be a bit more transparent. So what we did, we took our data, we fractionalised it into a, a pricing model that we can sell. And by fractionalising the pricing model into a digital product, this can help other projects like beach cleanup, seagrass, coral restoration. And if you can fractionalise and sell a nature project, this could be a total game changer for all these other nature projects that don't fit investment criteria to get the money they need to scale up and kick ass. So doing good is good for the environment, it's good for business, and companies want to align with people doing good shit. That's a lot of goods and that was a literal shit, not a real one. Righto? Because these companies, like mandatory, uh, the nature market is emerging. You got a, next year, I think it is, is there's a mandatory climate reporting that's going to come in. Very soon, mandatory nature reporting is going to follow that. Extended producer responsibility, that'll be pro uh, promoting businesses to, to do better practices, and everything becomes accountable. So the question is, what if we get this right? What if we plug a funding gap for nature projects? How do we make nature profitable? Again, if you made nature projects profitable, we would have a better world than where we are today, right? So it would mean humans, business, politicians would respect and value nature. It would mean businesses move from being, say, extractive to regenerative. It would mean um, a whole lot of good stuff. Like, it would be amazing, but if you cannot connect on an emotional level from the heart, we have to connect on a financial level from the wallet because you cannot do business on a dead planet.